Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to Fix Me If You Can lab session. So first of all, about this session, um, we're, this is going to be a brief introduction talk because for us, this is the first lab session that we have, and I think for you guys as well, and we were quite curious as to how it will work out. We have prepared you a site that is broken in several places. We have bro we broke it deliberately. But the, all of these issues that we prepared with the site are things that we typically find in the projects that we uh, unfortunately have to work with. Um, we will ask you to work in teams because we have prepared only so many uh, copies of this site. So um, after the, this introduction session, we'll ask you to break into teams. Um, we'll give out a password and uh, a site to each of you that you can reach through your laptop and you will work with that. There will be identical copies of each other, so it uh, should be fine. So let me introduce ourselves and the team. Um, delivering the session will be Alex, um, Hernani, and Theodore, and myself. Um, let's hear a little bit about Alex. Do you want to introduce yourself a bit? Um, my name is Alex, and I work as a technical consultant in uh, uh, at Takwea, and part of my job is to do site audits and security audits and performance audits of sites. That's when we kind of discover things that we want to show to you today. So, yeah, that's kind of about me. My name is Ernani. I'm a technical team leader of professional services in Europe for Acquia. Um, and, well, as, as Alex said, most of these examples came from real stories from our clients. Um, so I expect that um, sharing them with you uh, would allow you to not find them in many more clients that we audit. And uh, I'm Theodore. I work from France, a uh, technical consultant as well. Uh, I do a lot of work in Drupal core with JavaScript. And I'm also taking care of the mobile practice of the PS team uh, for Acquia. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much it. All right, uh, my name is Balaj. I'm also part of the Acquia Professional Services team, um, also a consultant. Um, we all travel the world and try to solve clients' problems and, or at least help them half the way. So all of the issues that you will see today are things that we typically come across throughout our engagements. So what we prepared for you is a typical setup for a Drupal website. We have a LAMP stack. Uh, we have Varnish that's set up, which is supposed to be part of a standard stack. Um, and we have set up approximately 20, 25 sites. So uh, we would like you to group up, perhaps people who are physically close to you, in about groups of five-ish, so that we have enough sites for everyone to hand out and to start working with. We will have, one, one of us will have, um, will be responsible for individual sessions, um, and the other three will walk around and help the teams as you go along and try fixing these sites. So. Now if you could find the team for yourself uh, and just kind of physically group up. How many teams? Um, we should group up with about people of five. I'm not sure how many people there are, so I can't say how many teams that is. But we have about 20, 25 sites, so that's basically the limiting factor. Say something to the I'll share the URL in a second after we just covered the schedule. Thank you. 
did the internet during the presentation? Well, that would be better than the nice. show things happening. Can you? No, no, but it was just to you know, disconnect. And, uh, but it got connected. Like <laughs> no, just because Twitter notification shows up. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So we have the team set up. Um, just a quick um, run over through the schedule. We will first start with the site building. We'll have a 10 minute break um, during which you can come to us, ask, ask any questions, etc. We would like to ask you to start sharp at the end of each break because we are on a quite tight schedule and there's a lot of stuff to discuss so we would not like to run out of time and we know that at the end of the lab everybody's going to get tired so let's uh, let's be punctual. Um, after that we'll discuss security, we'll have another break, um, after that we'll talk about performance and performance related issues uh, and we have about 25 minutes at the end for overlap time or questions and just a wrap up and a summary. Um, I would like to get uh, a count of the teams, so if I will say the team number and if you could just raise your hand just to make sure that we have uh, a different team assigned to, uh, team number assigned to each of the teams, so team one, team two, team three, four, five, six, seven, eight, perfect. So we have one site per team, we have one login per site, so um, obviously, you should, you're encouraged to work together. Um, the address will be uh, fixme.acquia-ps.com, as it's on the screen, uh, slash team and uh, a number, but passwords for your team uh, and your t URL, I think, as well, right? Yeah. Is going to be on the site. So if you just hit, up, hit this URL up, uh, you should be able to uh, get started. So as soon as um, everyone is set up, we will begin with the first session. Just uh, look at me when you feel like you you can get started, and once I get a feel for where you guys are at, we can begin. They are in the, it's in the row. So ask why when people start to log in. Sorry. When people start to log in. Okay. I can make it anywhere we can go. And we have. So login works for everyone. Any problems with the sites? Worked. That was the first obstacle, but uh, <laughs> it's a feature, not a bug. Um, I don't know, it's one of the nodes. It's on the front page. If you, if you go to the site, it should be on the front page.
Okay, who is uh, who's still struggling with the setup or authentication? Everyone is more or less okay to go? Okay, anyone still struggling with the setup or not? Okay, so I will, I will assume that, yeah. I don't uh, understand. You won't be able to change files. Then. Yes, yeah, there will be no file access required uh, right now. Um, so we encourage you to do this hands-on. Um, it will be best if you have two browsers available. I mean, you will ha all have laptops, so you probably know how to start an incognito window because in some of the exercises, we, we would like to test um, or show you how to um, like demonstrate a particular issue with authentication and um, non-authentication, so these will be the, um, I mean, it might be useful for you. So. The GitHub repo, we need to show it. We need to show the GitHub repo? GitHub repository. Okay, where is it? In active PSO, slash kids me. Okay. So, but it's not public, is it? It's not in, it's not in the slides. After that, who's doing the side door? Uh, but is it public? Yes. Yeah. So you're yours. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so if you want to have access to, well, see the code and check it out, uh, you can go to GitHub, uh, acquia-pso, uh, the fixme repository. Uh, you should have access to it. At least read access. Uh, everyone on the page? Oh, well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right, so we'll get started. If you need to, I mean, right now we don't really need to look at the code uh, straight away, so we can get back to it uh, afterwards. Uh, what? Yeah, Google. Okay, so first, uh, first part we're going to look at is uh, site building. And uh, what we mean by that is kind of, uh, you get a new website uh, that your clients say it's broken. It doesn't tell you what's broken, or how it's broken, or how bad it's broken. It just wants you to fix it, or to tell him how to fix it. Um, so uh, what we're going to look at first is uh, best practices, so what are the best practices and how can we check a huge code base against uh, best practices. We have coding standards, we have security and performance uh, best practices. Uh, security and performance are going to be covered by uh, Hernani and Alex afterwards. Uh, for now, we'll just look at the coding standards. Um, then you have code architecture uh, for custom module, uh, how you can check that a module is properly developed and that it follows Drupal best practices. Then content architecture and a little bit about configuration. Uh, which process do you use when you get a new website? First, well usually you get the code base and a database dump. So first step is to make it run on your local computer so you can actually do things with it. Uh, then you run automated tools that exist uh, for checking very common mistakes that you don't really need to manually check. Um, you, you look at what those tools are giving you. 
and you decide which uh, warnings or errors are important and which are not. So it takes a bit of experience and we can, if you have questions, we can uh, walk you through that. Um, usually there's custom code, so you need to read everything. Even if it's uh, one, 2,000 line of code, uh, you will need to go through it at least quickly to make sure that you didn't uh, miss anything. Automated tools are great, but they don't catch everything, so you still have some work to do. Um, and then you just look into the messy area uh, that you found out by reading the code and by looking at the output of automated tools. Uh, what we use, it's uh, first update module to see if there's any update you can make to any uh, Drupal core or contributed modules on the website. The hacked module to see if any patch has been applied to Drupal core or, or any of the contributed module. Because I mean, we say don't hack core, but happens all the time. So you need to check for it. Uh, the coder module will tell you if the custom code follows Drupal coding standards or if there are any potential security issue uh, that uh, you can check for without you know, going too deep into it. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, uh, PHP code sniffer, so that's a tool developed by the PHP community and the coder module will provide a Drupal configuration uh, to check the coding standard like documentation standards, the just two space, for tabs and not, uh, and not tabs, these kind of things, uh, that can be automatically checked by the code sniffer tool. Uh, so we work at Acquia, so we get uh, Insight, which is a tool for our hosting environment. Basically, it does what update and hacked module do. So, I mean, it's easy, I just put it there. You don't need to use it, but it's really handy sometimes. And also you need a brain because uh, tools don't find everything. So, yeah, sorry. Um, once you get the output of your tools, uh, you should check for a few things that will tell you if the audit or if your fix is going to be hard or not. Uh, the first one is the PHP filter module. If it's enabled, uh, you can start to get a bit scared. Uh, because you will need to see if there's any PHP in nodes, uh, in views, in blocks, these kind of things. And then can be really messy to debug. Uh, then PHP in templates, like if uh, the developers have, have made database query inside the templates, uh, that's not a good thing. So it's probably going to take you a while for listing all that's wrong with the website. When you have a lot of template, template files, it might you know, tell you that uh, the design wasn't really sorted out properly and that it could use some, uh, some work. Uh, same with views, blocks, panel. Maybe they didn't see that they could configure something to reduce the amount of views and panels. Uh, and the content types as well, that's tied with the template files. But we'll see an example afterwards. Uh, so the first one uh, we're going to look at is, uh, is my Drupal core and country module uh, hacked or patched? Uh, so to do that, uh, log in to your website as admin. Uh, you should enable the labs application module on the module page. Uh, that will uh, enable the update hacked module and everything that you need. Uh, sorry? C can you repeat the question? Do you mean remote or local site? Uh, well, the website you just got access to uh, earlier. Like with the past, yeah, remote, yeah. Or well, if you have it locally, you can do that as well. It's <laughs> so can you can you show the, show the site? Hmm? You can show the site. Uh, yeah, so for example, uh, I'm logged in, I go to the module page, I'm going to...
<laughs> yeah, well, demo effect. So now we should be going to the module page and enable the lab application module. That's toward the bottom. Uh, that will enable the update module, the hack module, and I don't have internet apparently. Um, team sites, but <laughs> I, I don't even have, you know, the. Internet doesn't. It's not special if I use it. Even I don't have internet. Apparently. Uh, so once you enable the application, yeah, that's uh, well. Sometimes it happens. Uh, so everyone has a hack module enabled. C can you make sure they enable it and run it? Uh, so if you so if you go to report and hacked, it should run uh, the script to check if the core or country module have been hacked. It takes a little while because there's a lot of modules, but you know, we can. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, if it's different, they look into it. So uh, you also have the diff module enabled, and you will be able to see what changed, what has been patched exactly on the contributor core. So it might take a few minutes to, to run, and you end up on a page like that afterwards. So uh, how far along are you, like 10%, 20%? Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so maybe I can just uh, show you what it looks like at the end. And uh, once that finishes for you, you can verify that I'm not making this up. This up. <laughs> Um, so once this very long process finishes, <laughs> you end up on this page and it will show you all your country module and your core and say, has it been changed from the version on Drupal.org or not? So, you know, there's a few modules, the theme. Uh, the only thing that has been hacked, uh, strangely enough, is core. Uh, so if you have the diff module enabled, you can click on on the link and have the list of files and see which one have been changed. So, well, and below that it's all green. There's too many files anyway. Uh, so, I mean, they hacked the readme, the gitignore, that's not a big problem, we don't really care. It's not executed, but they have system.install. So this one can be pretty dangerous. Uh, so if we look into that, uh, we can see that on the current version, which is on the right, yeah, that's right. Um, <laughs> uh, there's some, uh, there's an update function that has been added. So if you run the update on your website, you will get this thing executed. Uh, well, this particular patch is to make Drupal 7 handle files bigger than four gigabytes, uh, because the size of the uh, of the r of the column on the table is not big enough, so it doesn't, you know, handle more than four gigabyte files. Uh, so this one is not is not really dangerous, but sometimes maybe they will hack for uh, the user module 
for the registration, do some weird stuff uh, when a user register. That's more dangerous, and I mean all kind of things. It's we can see some crazy things. Uh, so I guess while the hack module is still running, we can <laughs> uh, look into the, the rest. Uh, do you have any question about the hack module or the process of ju you know just seeing what's been changed? No, all, all clear. All right. <coughs> Uh, so then, we have the update module. Uh, if you, well, it's going to take a while as well, but if you run it on the website currently, it will say that there's a module with a security release uh, available. Um, so I mean, that's a very basic check, but you'd be surprised how many developers just turn off the update module, develop for a few months, and just forget about it. So then you get a six month uh, old Drupal core, uh, that you have to audit, and you're like, well, there's been five security audits since that, uh, patches since then, so maybe you should update it. Uh, how to keep it up to date? Uh, it's easy, just keep the update module enabled, and actually update the module when it tells you to, uh, because that way you will catch bugs earlier, so that's a win for everyone. Uh, yeah, and I can't demo that because I don't have internet, so uh, <laughs> you have to trust me on this one as well. Um, then we have coding standards. Uh, so this one, uh, it's kind of more boring than the update and the hack module because you will need to read code and check you know, that it's two spaces, not three, and these kind of things. The coder module, when you have the peer PHP code sniffer package installed on your laptop can check for most of the coding standard violations. Um, so I used to have the page open, but it's gone now. Uh, and it's the same kind of uh, concepts. Uh, so if you're live on the website, you can go to the configuration page, and you have a coder link on the right side of the on the right side of the page. Oh, okay. So you go to configuration. That was a bad idea. Uh, Uh, you go to configuration, you follow the coder module, uh, coder link module, and you see you can see what you what you want to check. Uh, so here I have Drupal code sniffer uh, because the code sniffer package is installed, so the tool can run. Then the coding standards uh, document uh, some very basic security checks. Uh, usually you start with normal or critical because then otherwise you get way too many uh, warnings. Uh, here I'm just going to select like two modules to not uh, have a crazy output. Uh, that's going to be the email login module. If I can find it. Oh yeah, email auto login and the jQuery countdown. So that's country module I downloaded uh, because I wanted, you know, maybe to, f to make some fancy things on my website. And usually it's pretty fast, but... Yeah. Um. And we, we also see a lot of uh, clients that try out modules and then they don't uh, remove them once they're done with it. Well, in best case, they disable them, but usually just leave them here. Uh, so does everyone is on the coder page, uh, was able to go to the form I showed just before? Uh, yes, no, maybe? No? So, oh, it's okay, yeah. <laughs> Slowly. Uh, 
Uh, I would probably take uh, maybe in the break. Maybe in the break you could take that time. Yeah, because I mean that's automated tool. It's not really. Uh, <laughs> it's the less interesting part of the session. So. Uh, it's a little bit of both because it doesn't catch everything that could break your website. I mean, the email autologin uh, module is actually an example of that. Um, it will tell you, uh, I guess, probably most of the of the big problems. At least the one that you can check automatically. It won't catch like recursion or redirect loops or whatever. But it will tell you that your SQL statement is probably not filtered enough or those kind of uh, basic mistakes. Um, so the kind of things it tells you is that you know, you're missing a doc block, you're missing, uh, like the way you write the else if is not the proper way, uh, this kind of thing. So that's why you need to uh, scan through the results and decide which one are important or not. I mean, coding style, it will make the code hard to look, to look at, but it won't break the module. Um, so now you see on the email autologin module, you have uh, well, a few pages of uh, warnings, comments. But it, uh, you know, there's no critical issue about this module. Uh, but if you go to the module page and you try to enable the module, uh, your website will crash. Because if you open the email module file, there's a PHP error in it. And the coder module didn't tell you that. So that's why once you run the automated tool, you, you also need to read all the code uh, because that's the only way to check for, for those kind of things. Um, and that's where IDs are really uh, helpful because they can do uh, better checks than the coder module. So you know, a pretty boring output, it's going to tell you that uh, you know, don't use globals as well the name of your global variable is not, you know, that's not great. Um, and uh, yeah, as far as the coder module goes, that's, uh, that's basically it. Um, it's just to guide you to, to know which uh, area of the website you will need to look into uh, more afterwards. So is that clear for everyone, like what we do with the coder upgrade? update and hack module. So di did anyone end up uh, running that? Or is it still running somewhere? St still running? OK, right. So you have the outputs available. OK. It's gone. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> well, you broke the website. <laughs> they fix it. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, that's not what it's about. <laughs> so I just have uh, two other slides uh, that I will go very fast because I just have a couple of minutes left on the site building. Uh, uh, slots before the break, and at the break you can, you know, ask, come up and ask us questions or whatever you want. Um, so the the other kind of thing we see uh, often. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, well, here you can't really fix anything because you don't have access to the code, but well, the problem is that if you have uh, a website that, well, if you don't follow coding standards, it's hard for people to look into it. So if you open the code and look at the email module. I'm, I'm what's, what's, I'm fixing a customer problem. Well, I mean, that's a customer problem because it, it creates development time. So if, if it's hard to get into the code, it's hard to change it. And if you look at the email login module, the, the developer doesn't use brackets on if and else all the time. And the PHP error is that he put it on one and did not close it. So you know it's those kind of things. Coding standards will you know remove that kind of thing. And I mean PHP error are a problem for your customers. <laughs> okay. No, that's fine. I mean, <laughs> if you think it's useless, uh, I mean let me know and I try to change your mind. <laughs> uh, then you have the kind of views configuration kind of things. Uh, so I just uh, skipped this one. The, basically, the problem is that the user uh, created three different views, where one view with a contextual link would have would have worked just fine. So this one just you know increased the number of views. Uh, that's more memory. That's more crap. Uh, so. Uh, so th that was the views architecture. Then the content architecture, the last exercise, uh, it's just a show and tell. Uh, it's linked to the number of templates. So usually you find, uh, it happens pretty often actually. So you have an article content type, there's 2,000 uh, content items uh, of this one, a teaser, microsite, 200 content uh, like nodes of this type. And then you have things like sports homepage, teams homepage, change password content type, the login form content type, or footer homepage content type, and, that's, and there's just one node of each of them. And you can have like 20 content types with one node. So here you see that they probably should have used the panel or one content type with a different taxonomy term or value that they can change the template with or something. Uh, but it's you know, clearly, clearly wrong. And if you have 100 content types, it's going to impact your performance. So it's those kind of things that you need to check uh, for site building as well. And uh, it's a break. So uh, if you have questions, uh, feel free to ask. There's four of, the, four of us. And uh, yeah, we have 10 minutes. The inside, the which one the report? Uh, well, this one you have to go in the database and count it. Uh, so we we have a tool that do, that does those red flag checks automatically, uh, spits out a report that say this many item in your content type, this many vocabulary item, this kind of things. But since it's not black and white, we can't put that in Coder, for example. Well, that was I was saying. We, when we can, we use Insight, like the tool that Acquia developed for the hosting, because it does the updates, hacked, uh, and also uh, configuration checks. Like this uh, uh, text format is not secure because you allow random HTML in it. Uh, that will show up in Insight and this kind of thing. But uh, on Contrib, there's nothing that I know of that do these kind of checks. There's a, there's a model called architecture that would give you at least this one. Oh, yeah, here you go. So it, but it, this one is very easy to get. It's like a list of contacts. Yeah, it does a few things, but I think uh, Alex is going to talk about that on the security part of the presentation. Um, and also, if you have, uh, like, for the end of the session, if you have any use case that you have right now, you say, well, I got this bug, I don't know how to fix it. Uh, maybe that's a good use case to, to you know, to, to have a look into. Mm -hmm.
And if you want to grab a drink or something, uh, feel free. Uh, we'll start with the security part of the presentation. Hmm? Oh, yeah, sure. 
Well, if internet is working. So, uh, hi everyone, I'm Alex, and the next session is about security. Um, can you hear me like this? Sort of, like this, better, okay, cool. So, I, I wanted to start with a question, how many of you have hacked into a website? Nice. You should do it, because it's fun, and plus it's very useful. Um, because um, to be able to secure your website, you need to kind of understand who is on the other side of the barricade, what tools they have, what methods they use, and also put your mind into this uh, frame where you understand that as soon as you uh, put your website live or connect to the internet your infrastructure, it will get hacked at some point. Not get hacked, but there will be attempts to hack into it. So being aware of, of this is important. And when you are developing, you should know the techniques that uh, an attacker can use to like exploit and get into your website. Um, so here's a graph that shows uh, vulnerabilities by popularity. Um, obviously, the number one vulnerability always has been the cross-site scripting one. Uh, then, then the next one is access bypass, cross-site request forgery, um, SQL injection, and there are many others, but we will not cover them today, we will not touch them today. Um, so for today, we will start with access bypass, and for most of these uh, exercises, you will need two sessions open to the same uh, website. One is anonymous and one is like logged in user, like admin, the, the username and password that you have received. So you can use either two browsers or a single browser but with two tabs, like in Chrome you can use incognito mode because you will need to see the difference. Uh, like some actions will need to be executed by a logged in user. Uh, okay. So access bypass, um, is something that can happen when you misconfigure permissions in your Drupal site, or you misconfigure access mm, control in things like views, for example. So basically, um, access bypass can happen when you have weak control of a, a resource. So you kind of let people see something that they don't need to see and do something that they don't that they shouldn't be able to do. And there are two levels of, uh, two levels where you can add protection to it. One of them is authentication. Uh, it's the step where you authenticate the user. So you kind of uh, decide who that individual or a system is. Is he a user that you know about? And the next step is authorization, when you already know who he is you kind of need to decide, uh, does he have permissions to perform certain action on a resource, like view a node, or change a node, or create a user, things like that. Um, yeah, so just to recap, um, access bypass is basically when a user has the ability to do something that he shouldn't be able to do, like view an entity, or modify that entity, whatever that entity is, or perform some custom action like send an email from uh, your website. 
So this is a good example. Uh, like probably you know the devel module and the devel module has the variable editor part of it, like a tool that lets you edit variables in the variable table. And if you misconfigure your permissions, uh, anonymous users can access this tool and basically they can then do anything with your site. And well, there are sites live now that have that permission for anonymous users. <laughs> so it may sound like, um, like strange that people can do this, but people do this and maybe people forget, like they debug something and then they don't disable that permission. Um, so to stop access bypass, you need to implement checks. If you're writing a custom, custom module, for example, you need to check like before providing tools for that user to perform an action, like before sending him out a node edit page with a node edit form. You need to check if that user has the access to that form. And the next step is you need to check whether that user can actually, um, whether that user can actually create or modify that node. And the next step happens when the user submits that form or an attacker just sends a direct post request to your site. Okay. Um, so the first hands on, hands on or like exercise, um, you need to go to a URL, which is here. Can you guys see it? Um, yeah, it's um, slash admin slash dashboard slash user slash all. And that should happen as an anonymous user. So once you get there, you will see an administration view uh, with some views bulk, bulk operations, uh, like the, this module is enabled and it provides some um, actions that you can perform on nodes or users or some custom actions like sending an email. So you are now an um, anonymous user. So Drupal should not let you block users or send emails from the system. But once you get to that page, you will see that that action list is actually there, so you kind of um, you kind of let people. Well, we kind of let people do that. You can send an email or block a user. You can try that. Actually, that works. But better not to try send email. But blocking users is fine. Uh, but sending email is just not something we want you to do. <laughs> okay. Um, does anyone have an idea why did that happen? Why did anonymous user get to that view and got to those actions? Because there are two levels here. One level is the access to that page, the, to view that view of all users, right? And the second level happens when you perform that action, so when you block a user or you try to send an email, so another check should be there. So there are two places which um, have something like wrong in it. Does anyone have an idea? Maybe page access has something inside the menu. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. So that's actually a view. Uh, so that view has the access check there, but in permissions, uh, anonymous users uh, user has the permission to like over like bypass all views access. So that's also can sound uh, a bit stupid for a person to check that box, but in Drupal 6 that would happen very often because it was just named uh, in a bad way that users can, uh, all people are thinking that you need to check that box for people to be able to view any view, like any kind of view. So, but still, and nowadays we see websites that do this. Um, but this doesn't answer the another question, like why, uh, the first question is why can I access this page, the view of all users? Now the second question is why can I send an email or perform a certain action? There should be a check there. Any idea? 
Um, well, permissions are fine. Like, users should not be able to block users. Yeah, so this is something bad with uh, like custom code, let's say, or contrib code. So VBO module comes with uh, one module inside, which is called actions permissions module. I'm not sure why they do it this way, but you kind of, you need to enable that module to prevent users from sending emails and blocking other users. So that's, that's an example of what can be done in not the best way, uh, like to protect your site. Like you have two modules and it's not obvious that you need to enable that. And I don't really see a use case to let users send emails, like anonymous users send emails there. A kind of strange use case. Okay. So the next example is, uh, or next vulnerability type is cross-site scripting. Um, and this one is the most popular one. Like, I think 40% on that diagram was the cross-site scripting. And if there are any theme developers, you should be really aware of cross-site scripting things because uh, most of the cross-site scripting um, vulnerabilities that we find are in template files or like pre-processed functions, so basically in theme layer. Um, so in essence, cross-site scripting is something that lets user perform an action uh, without a user's intent, but with his credentials, and without him actually knowing this, because this can happen in the background. And if you introduce this type of vulnerability on your site, so anything that that user can do with your site uh, through cross-site scripting using JavaScript, an attacker can do much faster. So. <laughs> If you can delete users, I don't know, one by one, then the attacker can delete them in a script in a very fast way. Okay. So this diagram shows just uh, the steps in which cross-site scripting like attack can happen. Um, so an attacker just submits a, some piece of JavaScript together with your content, like with a comment or with a blog post. And then that JavaScript ends up in the database. So nothing bad happens here. This is normal Drupal behavior because it's good that malicious JavaScript code end up in the, ends up in the database because then you can you have more tools and ways to um, to investigate an issue if that happened. You can actually see which user did this, maybe see the IP address that that did this. If uh, Drupal would filter out that malicious JavaScript before putting it into the database, uh, that that wouldn't be the case. You wouldn't be able to track down when it happens. So the second step is the important step, is when a victim uh, requests a page and Drupal renders together with that script, with malicious JavaScript code, and renders it and sends back in a format that browser will recognize as JavaScript and execute. So that's the bad part of it. That should never happen because you should always think that any user supplied data is insecure so before you output that data back to another user or the same user, you need to sanitize it. You need to like strip down HTML tags out of there or script tags, any malicious JavaScript code, there are libraries to do that. And there are like Drupal uh, has the text formats and in text formats you can uh, kind of configure which tags you want to allow. And very often we see that People just allow any tag, and that's the most dangerous thing. Because sometimes people think, well, uh, my site is only accessed by admins, and I kind of trust my admins, and they are trusted users, so they can, they should be able to, to like post script tags and iframe tags and embed codes, uh, like object codes. Um, but at any point in time, your trusted user can become untrusted. You never know how he connects to your website. You never know where his laptop is. You never know like which network he uses, if it's secure or not secure. So any user is not really a trusted user. I, I, like, I'm a bit paranoid here, but I don't trust users and user authentication. So 
this is the step three, just, just showing that once the JavaScript has been sent to the browser of the user, the browser will execute that. And as soon as it does that, um, that JavaScript code has uh, the access that your user has, so it has the session cookie, and any request that comes into your website, your Drupal backend won't ever recognize that that's a malicious activity. It will be a normal request for him. So there are many ways to like sanitize your data and many ways of output unsanitized data. So here's an example of what we sometimes find. So no title is kind of user supplied data, so you shouldn't trust it. And then you set a title with that title and then you just print that title in your TPL file. Then if I put some uh, JavaScript code there, it will be sent to the browser in a format that browser will understand and uh, like execute that JavaScript code. So that's very important for theme developers because most of these things we find in theme layer you need to understand where this data comes from, and only if it comes from, I don't know, PHP. If it comes from database, most probably it was supplied to you by the user. Any data should not be trusted and should be like sanitized before outputting it. Uh, Drupal has uh, already mentioned the text formats, so the important bit is to configure those text formats not to be over permissive. So uh, you need to strip out script tags, iframe tags. Uh, embed tags, object tags, and actually image tags, but <laughs> that uh, most often that doesn't happen because users, and like you have business requirements that say that people should be able to like post images and comments. There are other tools, there are libraries to like, uh, one is, is called HTML purifier that can detect sort of um, <laughs> things like that, but it's not easy, but, but just keep in mind that any data supplied by user is not uh, really trusted and you cannot just output it without any checks, any filtering. So our next hands-on is to see this in action. So first step is to go to uh, profile page of user one, but you need to be logged in there. And once you get there, you should notice the value in full, in full name field. Uh, and next step uh, is to open a special node that they have prepared. Um, it's on slash node slash 56. Um, you should be logged in just because what, what will happen there is that there is some malicious JavaScript that will do something bad. Um, and you kind of, you need to be logged in because that malicious JavaScript needs your permissions. So in real life use case, an attacker that would prepare a page like this, he would send you a URL to that page, for example. So on Twitter or somewhere, he can use some URL shortener and sh send you a short URL with a funny cat picture. And once you click on it, uh, you open that page and your browser executes JavaScript code and then Okay, can we start? So how many of you guys had a, a client calling you and said um, my site is slow? Pretty common? And usually like your most traditional answer is what do you mean? Like slow? Why? Is it, where is it slow? Is it slow on the server? Is it slow on the, on the front end? So that's the first thing that um, you need to understand when you talk about performance is, are you talking about a performance problem that is on the front end server or something that is happening on the server? Um, so usually when you look to a problem from the, the server's perspective or the back end perspective, um, what we typically find um, about slow applications are services on that website uses that are very slow or unre unresponsive. Things like the database is slow or the web service, there's a web service call that is very slow to, to respond and that because of that the PHP process starts to hang. Or the application is too complex and we see that a lot of times, like 
things that have been written or code that has been written that is not really such to handle 50,000 nodes, 1 million users, things like that. So when you, when you get to that scale, then it starts to degrade. Or when you start to have a lot of access, it starts to degrade. Um, and this one also happens, but I, I think that it's something that you always seem to fix in the end, which is like, well, you don't have enough servers to handle your traffic. And at that point, you start to scale. But much often, and all the times that we work uh, with clients, we always find like things that can be fixed and things that can be improved before we start thinking about let's change the server infrastructure or let's add more servers and things like that. It can also be um, front-end slowness. So um, you do have too many assets on the site, things like you're not compressing your CSS and then your browser is blocking the request that you're getting, or you do have some JavaScript that is very slow to render your DOM or change something in your DOM. So when you start looking to your site, what, what's the first thing that you look when, when you try to understand why is it slow? And when, when, when you realize that, well, actually, that's not only one page that is slow. Everything is slow. So if everything is slow, usually a good way to start is looking for the simplest page that you can render in a Drupal site. And you know what is it? It's probably a 404. So if you look for a page that does not exist on your site, that means that you are rendering your theme, you are rendering most of your blocks but you are not rendering any specific action that belongs to any specific path. So basically, if a, if a 404 takes two seconds to render, it means that every other page in the site is going to take at least two seconds to render, okay? Then you can start with more common pages, so things that your users are going to find all the time. So nodes, the home page, landing pages, so pages that um, they do have a lot of traffic, so if you have a problem on that specific page, then it can be a big problem for your site. And if you do have more data to that allows you to keep on tracking what's going on, then you should go to those pages. And this is something that I don't think that many people think of. Um, and it's, it's something very easy to understand. Like Drupal as a framework or as, as a CMS to build websites is built millions and millions of sites, so it's, it's quite easy to understand how much time is going to take a page in Drupal to render, how much time is it expected, the page to render. So when you render a page in Drupal, and of course it depends on the complexity of the page, depends how much information you have there, what you are doing to load the database and uh, should display that data, but usually what you should be looking is around one to one and a half seconds to generate that page. If it's lower, much better, but if it's get higher than that, starts to, um, um, seeing that something is not very well done. 40 or 60 memory, 40 or 60 memory of, uh, of memory, um, and uh, 100 to 300 queries, okay? So usually like to render a page, 100 queries in Drupal is something pretty normal. If it gets 200, it's okay. 300, 400, 500, something there is, starts to be very wrong. And again, simple pages like the 404s, are a very good way of understanding what's happening on the general level, and then you can go to um, the most detailed level. So tools that you can use to chase it, tools that you can understand how much complex is your application, and how can you um, find what's going on, and how do you can fix it afterwards. So what we're going to use in this lab is basically three, um, uh, three tools, like Devel. Does anyone, everyone know Devel? Yep. XHProf? Does anyone know how to debug with XHProf? No? Okay, good. So we are going to take a look on that. And sometimes in Drupal, especially when you use XHProf, sometimes it's hard to understand the XHProf um, trace profile. And the main reason for that is that there are a lot of functions in Drupal that in reality, what's important about the function is not really the function name, that's what XHProf gives you, but the function argument. Like if you get call user func, doesn't really mean anything if you don't understand what, are the, what is the argument that is there. So either you have experience and you know how to trace back that call to go to the upper level and understand what's going on, or sometimes it's easier just to put time, timer start, timer read to API functions from Drupal core and, and just debug that and, and just understand when you are rendering that specific trace of code, put a timer start in the beginning, put a timer read in the end, and understand how much it took, okay? So five things that we are going to see uh, today. First of all is slow queries, okay? So usually it's, uh, you, you open the vel and you look to the number of queries, like I told you, 100 queries, that's cool, that's fine. Um, however, five seconds to generate those 100 queries are not fine. 
Okay? So usually if you have a low number of queries and you do have a large amount of time spent on those queries, usually it means one, two, three, four, five bad queries. So it's easier to trace to a single point where your application is loading something from the database that is very slow. Okay? So we are going to look to one of those. Second one is a bit more complicated. It's like the, the query time is, is high, um, but the number of queries is also high. So that means that probably your queries are fast, but they are too many. So that means that probably you are loading too much information from the database, or it means that you are doing something weird to get to that data, to that data. and most of the time, it's not only the time that you get um, to, to, to look to that, to that data from the database. Yep. Ah, uh, sure. So I was saying the number of queries is high, the number of the, the query time is high, it's like almost four seconds. But another thing that is interesting is that when you load data uh, from the database, that means that probably Drupal is doing something with it as well. So it's not only the query time that is slow, it's what you are doing afterwards with your data is also slow for sure. So and you can see um, the amount of memory that I'm consuming here is already 80 megs, which is the double that I told you that would be okay. Okay? So you are loading a lot of data from the database, you are spending a lot of time processing it, um, and you are consuming too much memory. Okay? Third case that we are looking is edge cases. So basically like something that you thought, well, this is a bit slow, uh, but it just happens once or twice, so that's fine, and actually it happens all the time. So things like hooking it that you thought, oh, just, they are just going to happen in this specific situation or in that specific situation, and it happens in every page rendering. Um, or things that are a bit more um, weird and hard to, to find, like it, it's very easy to plug in Drupal having like a hook node load or a hook node view. The problem with those type of hooks is that it's very easy to plug something in a location that you don't want to, and then every time that you do something like a node load, then you are executing that trace of code. Okay? And the, the other things that we can, you can put in this category is things like um, you have a block, and the block is rendering in all the pages, and you saw that the block was just showing on the node because you are cutting the way that you are showing it via a template or, or, or via CSS or via something like that. Special task is something that happens a lot as well. So imagine that you have a special task that happens on your site, like a cron job or something like that, that is very slow, and then you are executing from time to time or very periodically, then at that time, the site can have, can have problems. Okay, so let's go some hands-on. So what you need to do, um, as I said, you need three tools for, uh, for this part. So Devel, XHProf, and the second one is uh, just a browser inspector like Chrome Developer Tools or Internet Explorer Developer Tools or Firebug or something like that, okay? So everyone knows how to enable um, uh, Devel? That's a very easy one, right? See if I can access the site. Are you able to access it? Anyone was able to access it, the websites that you have? Is it working or not? Very slow? Can you research to us twice these things? Varnish HTTP and then my seat or something. Yep. 
Okay, back to life. So, so to enable Devel, you just need to convey configuration. And in Devel, it allows you to do three nice things. Um, query log is interesting. It allows you to see what are the queries that you are executing on the page. The other two things that are interesting is uh, the page timer and the memory usage. Um, Devel also integrates with SHProf, so you can actually enable SHProf here. But you need to have XHProf library installed on the, on the site. So usually what we recommend is to use XHProf model for Drupal, which is very easier to, um, to install. You just enable the model. As long as you have the XHProf extension, you are good to go. OK? So let's enable XHProf. Uh, let's enable Devel. Let's enable XHProf. Okay, so if everything goes well, now if I go to my home page, if I'm logged as the super admin in this case, I do have a couple of more interesting debug information in the bottom of the page. Um, so there's a link for an XHProf report, and um, there's the amount of queries that I'm doing, so 86 and 100 milliseconds, that's cool. And also I can see all the queries that I'm doing um, on, on the site, okay? So let's look to the first, um, uh, exercise. So if I go up on the site, and if I click in, uh, wait, how do I put? Yeah. So if I go to the list of Drupalists, if that would be the Drupal site, a DrupalCon site, and if I click in the first user demo, let's say that this is a, Drupal, a DrupalCon site, and um, I'm showing the profiles of different users that contribute to Drupal, and I have a tab that actually integrates with Drupal.org and show me all the commits that the user has done um, to the Drupal project. So if I click on Drupal commits, then actually what it's doing, it's loading, um, it's doing a query against another database. And this query, it's very, very slow. Let's see if I can even show it. Can we start the again? Or, yeah? No. There's a, there's a query here or here. No, I cannot show you this one. Um, if you are able to download the site, you should be able to see it. But basically, it's, um, it's, it's a good example for the first example I gave you. So it's um, a large query that is doing a bunch of joins. And because of that, it's very, very slow. So you would see in the bottom, you'd see um, the amount of memory that you are consuming, the amount of time that you are consuming. OK? So this one did not work. Let's try the next one. So this one should work. Let's see. So I told you that one of the one of the things that you could use to understand what's going on on the site, it's going looking to a 404 page and understand how slow it is. So that would be kind of the, the bottleneck or the the, the base stone for the rest of your of your site. So let's say that I I, lo I look for something like um, Prague or something with an error that. Um, Not working at all. Okay. It's harder with a French keyboard, I can tell you. <laughs> Who told you that doing this thing with the numbers was a good idea? <laughs> So I was saying that um, to have XHProf working with Devel, you need to have the XH library, the XHProf library installed and configured as a virtual host on your server. 
So you need to like go to your server slash xhprof, blah, 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 and then you'd be able to access the xhprof reports that your server is generating. Um, if you use xhprof model, uh, all of that routing is done via Drupal, so you don't need to worry about anything like that. Yeah, so that's, that's what I'm going to show you right now. So that's a good question. Um, so this page takes like 400 milliseconds to render, and it's a 404 page, OK? So it's kind of OK, but it's probably like a bit too slow. So if you look to an XHProf output, it will give you um, essential information. So it will give you two things that are very important. One is wall time. Wall time is time that your application is not really working, but it's waiting for something, okay? So usually it's waiting for things like a database or it's things for like a web service call. Um, so usually like understanding what's the difference between the CPU time and the wall time, it's a, good, it's a good way of understanding if you are depending on something that is slow, which is not really um, the PHP process, okay? So, and the first thing it will give you is it will sort by the top 100 functions that you have on the site, okay? So if you look to these 100 um, calls, you see that on the top 100, um, or in the top 20, everything seems like normal, okay? So Drupal starts, does the main, does the menu execute Android, which is like, okay, I want to understand what's the function that I'm going to render on that page. Um, it renders the page, it, until now it's, it's fine, but now it's starting rendering the blocks, okay? And if you look to the blocks, so you see that there's a, a function in the bottom called DrupalCon show weather, okay? And if you look to the, the page itself, so this page here, it does not have any weather block, okay? So you don't see it, okay? Um, however, the code is there. And if you go back to the call, so you can click on Drupal Con show weather, it will tell you, oh, I'm taking um, 200, um, 200 milliseconds to generate that, that call. And if you look inside it, you have, um, there's a sleep function of 200 milliseconds, okay? So it's, it's, it's slow because we put a sleep there that makes it slow. And, and the reason why is it um, slow, and I can show you here, so if you look to the codes, if you're able to look inside sites, this network connection is terrible. So inside sites, all models custom, uh, you have a DrupalCon weather model, and that's, that's, that's slow, okay? Okay, so inside the weather, as I was saying that there was several child functions, one of them is a sleep. The sleep is 200 milliseconds, that's slow, okay? Um, but you don't see the, you don't really see that the block is not there. So if you look to the blocks configuration, that's something that it happens a lot of times, is that all the blocks that you have here, um, defined as, as blocks for the different regions of your site, unless you set it to appear only for certain coordinate types or only for certain paths, even if you are not showing, as I was not showing in the 404 page, they are being rendered, okay? So the weather block, right now, I'm, I'm not showing it because I just, I just have a region enabled in some page template, but I'm rendering all the time. So it's always taking 200 milliseconds in every page function, in every page render that I have from my site, okay? And that's very, very common. We see that a lot of times. We see pages that take two, three, four seconds because all the blocks from the, from the site they are showing in every page. So that means that they are showing on the home page, on node pages, on 404s, everywhere. Every time that you are rendering a Drupal page, you are rendering all those blocks that are not controlled, okay? Something else that we see a lot of times is complexity. So imagine like, you, had a way, you, you know that to do something in Drupal is always very easy, and it's always, there's a lot of ways of doing things in Drupal, and sometimes there's not a very better way than the other one. However, if you think about performance and if you think about what am I doing with my data and that I'm getting and I'm rendering, then you can get in situations where adding extra complexity can be, can be very problematic. So for this one, let me show you something on the site. So if you go to the home page again, 
And if you go to the sessions page, I have here a block that shows me all the past sessions that have been present in, in a DrupalCon, for instance. Okay, so it's a normal jump menu um, where you can um, just click on it and it will, it will move you to the session. Um, if you look to the number of queries and the amount of um, time that you spend on the queries, it's a little higher. And um, if you look to um, the amount of page time that was spent on the page execution, then it's also higher, okay? So, and if you look to the XHProf output, it will tell you why again. So you start looking to the page and you see that at some point, again, we saw the 10 normal functions that are there and they are usually there. So like, if you sort by inclusive time, they would always be there. The one trick that you can do, however, is saying, okay, let me change by exclusive time. So here you would get things like slips and um, PDO executions and memcache gets and things like that. So it's basically like time that you spend inside the function inclusive. So if you come back, if you come back, you see that there is a function called DrupalCon sessions block view that is very slow. So that function from all the one and a half seconds that we took to render this page, this function took 500 milliseconds. So one third of the time that you are spending on our application to render this page, you just spend on this little block that is just showing me the list of last Drupal cons and just present me a select box, which is very, something very simple, right? I need to go to the database, get, I don't know, 100, 200, 300 um, titles and show them, okay? So why is it slow? If you look to the code, let's see if I can show you. In GitHub. Do you have the code opens anywhere, Tiller? Instead of GitHub? Can some, someone open the, the code and see what's there? So it should be inside this DrupalCon um, sessions model. So inside the custom folder. Where is that? Here? Okay, sorry. Yeah, so it's here, sorry. Oh, so let's see if we can see the codes. Uh, Where do I put this? Yeah. So to show this. Yeah. So I'm calling this function, which is the DrupalCon show session menu, which is this function. So what, what I'm doing is basically, I'm doing an entity field query that basically goes to your um, database and gets you entity IDs. And then I'm doing a node load multiple. Um, and then I'm just um, setting, the, passing the content to a form, okay? So why is this slow? Yeah, so the node loads, if you look to the, or if you, if you try to count the amount of checkbox or the options that I have in the dropdown, I think I have around 400 and 500. So it means that to populate that, that dropdown, I'm actually loading 400 or 500 nodes, okay? And that's always very slow, okay? Even if that node information after the first load, most of it is cached, and if you can use um, entity, uh, entity cache afterwards to, to cache that information, it's always a work that you are doing when things are not caching. So in situations where things are not cached and you do have a lot of concurrent requests, then you might have a problem, okay? So what would be a solution for this? What, instead of doing this, what should I be doing? Yep, so fetch a title within a custom query will be a way. Um, lots of times to do things like this, you can just use views as well. Like to do this, if you create a view that the output or the, the display format is uh, the jump menu, then you'd have the same thing, right? And most of the times also, instead of writing a custom query, um, it's, it's actually easier to just write your view and then call that view and get the results back from the view, 
Okay, so you don't need to worry about SQL. You don't need to worry about the next time that uh, you, you have a major update from Drupal, you need to rewrite all your SQL. If everything is done via the normal ways of getting data using views, then you don't have that problem anymore. Okay? So last example is a bit, is a bit more tricky, and it involves, um, um, it involves infrastructure. Okay? So how many of you have experience with uh, Varnish? Okay? So Varnish is a... Um, not very, um, not something very hard to explain. It's basically like a box that you put in front of your web servers. First time that you get a request, it doesn't know what you are talking about. It goes to the web servers, gets the request, gives it back to the user, and saves the answer in memory. So the next time someone asks for it, it knows, oh, I know that, and I know the answer for that request. So I'm going to reply to you directly from memory. So it's going to be super fast. Okay, very easy. Um, usually in Drupal or any application that do have some sort of personalization, um, you do not cache data that is different from the different users, so meaning that if you have a session cookie, then you are not cached. Um, if you don't have a session cookie, that means that you are anonymous, and then you can cache, okay? So in Drupal 7, you have um, direct integration with Varnish. As long as you enable Varnish, you configure your VCL, um, you set Drupal to cache the page, um, you should have pages being cached. Um, if you're authenticated, then you stop being cached, okay? So it means that every time I do a request, um, then if the request is the same, I should always get the same answer, so it should come from, from, from Varnish, or it should be super fast, okay? So let's try something here. So if I go to Drupal cons, and if I go to Drupal con Prague, it's a node, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy these, pray that the copy in French is the same as in uh, other languages. Open these, okay. And sh now I should be requesting the page from Varnish. So, if I open it a lot of times, and then I'm going to try to open uh, development mode. There we go. So let's see if I can show you this. So most, you, you, this, is not, this is not standard in, in Varnish, but most of the VCLs that you'd find out there on the web, they contain this information. So usually it's a good idea to put um, as part of your Varnish header response a header um, that will contain if the page came from the cache, from the Varnish cache, or from the backend, okay? So in this case, if you look to uh, the headers, you find that um, there is a, a hit here, okay? So that means that the page is coming from, from cache. And if I refresh it several times, no, not this one, because this one is going directly to Apache. Okay, so you see that it came from Varnish and it, it hit Varnish already once. Okay, so if I refresh twice, I get it twice. So it's coming from Varnish, Varnish is working well, right? So supposedly this page is never hitting the backend, right? So I request the page, the page is in Varnish, I'm fine, I don't need to worry about the performance on the backend because the page is coming from Varnish. And if you look to most of the, um, the assets there, it's also true, the same thing, right? You have CSS, you have JS, all of that you see Xcache is coming from, from Varnish, correct? However, this page has a problem. So if you, if you refresh the page and you look to all the requests, you see that I've put one of them, um, which basically, let's see if I, can, if I can show you what it's doing. So the use case is, so imagine that this page is in Varnish because it's a node about DrupalCon Prague, but you want this little piece here, the number of people that is attending, to be refreshed from time to time, so you, have, you want to have an expiration time on the amount of people that are attending the DrupalCon different from the main page, okay? So you don't want to clear the main page, you just want to refresh that small bit, okay? So I'm loading that small bit via Ajax, okay? So if you look to other requests, you'll see that there's one. If you want to filter it, you can filter by XHR, which is like um, 
Ajax calls. And you see that there's this request, okay? So in our pages, I'm requesting something like this, okay? So it's a URL that contains the node ID, and so the DrupalCon node ID, in this case, is 42002. Um, and if you look to it, and if you refresh several times, you'll notice that I'm always getting a miss. Okay, so you see like the X cache here, it's always a miss. So all the requests on the website are cached, everything is coming from Varnish. However, every time I do a request to this page, the, the page does an, another request via Ajax to another resource, and that's never cached. So in reality, what this means is that I'm hitting the backend all the time, okay? So why I'm hitting the backend? Why I'm getting a miss from this call? Any ideas? I can refresh several times. So the URL seems similar, right? It's like DrupalCon slash attendance slash 42002, and then I have some parameter. And if you look to it, the parameter is always different. This one does not give me what I want. Let's see if it comes. That parameter is always different, okay? So if the parameter is always different, that means the URL that you are asking from Varnish is actually always very different. It's not the same. Drupal identifies resources by the URL. If you are asking something with a different URL, then you always get a miss, okay? The reason why it's a miss is, I can show you the code, something that is also very easy to, um, to forget. But if you look to the codes, and if you look to this DrupalCon attendance model, which is um, doing the request. Let's see if I can hide this. Yeah, there you go. Um, so that's a normal uh, jQuery Ajax request, right? There's only something there that is a bit misleading for Varnish, which is the cache parameter, okay? So if you set a jQuery request, uh, Ajax jQuery request with cache sets to false, what jQuery is going to do is it's going to add a small cache stamp in the end. So the cache um, uh, entry that you have there, the key is always different. And that's the reason why Varnish is always um, not, not knowing what's, what's that. So that means that every time that you request a page, in reality, you are hitting the backend even if you don't know. Okay? It also means something else that is also bad. So Drupal, is Varnish caching this page or not? It is, right? In the second time I access the site, I don't get it because I'm asking something different. But the first thing I ask it is cached. So that means that in reality, Varnish is cached thousands and thousands of requests without any reason because any time that I'm going to ask something, it's going to be different, okay? So not only you are hitting the backend as you are filling your Varnish cache, and then it, it depends on how big it's your varnish cache, but you can run into a situation where it runs out of memory because you are just saving too many things there without any need, okay? And that was the last example um, I had. Just after all these, then that comes the normal, infrastructure, the, the normal performance talking about caching, okay? So before start caching, try to understand if what you are doing is really needed or not. Try to understand if it's the fast way you are doing it, and after that, then you can start caching. Um, and there's plenty of ways of caching, um, caching for anonymous, caching for authenticated, caching at the object level, caching at the partial level, caching at the page level. I do have a, a blog post about it if, um, if you want to check it out. And that, that was, the, that was the, the end. So as a summary, um, Drupal is, it's powerful because of its community. So before trying to fix something in your own way or something that you find that this is going to work because you know how to do it in PHP or you know how to do it before Drupal, always look to others with the same problem in the community. Look to the issues, make sure that you are not coming with something that is very tricky. If you are doing something very, very tricky in Drupal and you are the first one doing it, it's probably like a very good reason why you are the first one doing it, okay? Go step by step, never exclude poss possibilities. There are things that seem basic, seem obvious, and people forget about it. So always check the obvious. 
Um, learner tools that you introduce it to, they are simple, and if you know how to use them, if you have a good tool set on your hands, that's probably what you need. And I always try to understand the whole system. I always try to understand the whole figure. Drupal is, can, be, can become very complex because you can, uh, you can assemble much, a bunch of models that will change the way as the other models work. So always make sure that you understand what's on the root and go to the, go to the base root always of the problem. So that's the, the finish just before your opening for questions again. Um, we are hiring everywhere, so if these kind of problems is something that excites you and you feel uh, passionate about um, solving clients' problems, uh, we do have several positions either for uh, our team or for support or for sales or for engineering in almost everywhere in Europe. So if you are interested, just uh, talk to us. And we can open for question time. We have supposedly six minutes until, until we finish. The problems that we present here was something that you had before. Which ones were the like performance, security, architecture? What was the the most affected ones? Yeah, the behavior, the behavior of an application that has thousands of users or millions of users is it's very different. So it can be, you can be getting a situation where just a small thing that usually it's fast, at that point it's, it's very slow. Um, and we, we see that all, every day. So understanding where it's, where, where it's slow, at that point you need to go a bit more low level. You need to go to XHProf, you need to go to analyze the queries that you are generating, understand why they are sl slow, explain them, um, and try to understand. Another thing that I, I always find in performance that is missing from most of our clients is data. Like, if I ask to a client, how much time is your page taking to render? It's very rare that someone is able to render to answer me, okay? So for those kind of situations, you need data. You need, you need data in your Apache logs that saves the rendering time of your pages. You need things like New Relic that allows you to save um, a sample of pages from your site and understand how much time is it going to take to render. And at that point, if you know, okay, all my pages are taking 10 seconds to render, then, you know, you have a problem, and then you can start debugging where is the problem. But the first thing is always data. And then things like XHProf and some adoption of XHProf that can run from time to time, and then you can check from time to time, or things like TraceView or New Relic are very good tools to understand what's happening on the function level, and it's easier to understand what, why is it so slow. And usually when you have, like, you don't seem to have like a concurrent problem. You, you don't have concurrency, like three, four users is not really a big problem. It seems like probably like all the pages are slow there. So it's easier to get from one of those reports. So based on is always to guarantee that you have something called testing that is really testing. It's like as similar as possible to production. And if it's not, then it's not really testing. Um, sometimes it can be tricky, and I think everyone knows that, that convincing a client to have a complete replica of, of uh, production is, is not easy, and it can be costly. Um, but even like simple data, like you can run, like the XHProf model allows you to run to run an XHProf run every 300 requests. So you don't need to, it's something that is slow to run XHProf. But if you run them in every 300 requests, no one is gonna die for that. And it's probably like it's going to pay the bill in the end for the fact that you at least know what's going on. And other things like just put your render times in Apache logs, for instance. So you know that's something that will not affect your performance a lot and you'll know how much time did every page took to render. And then you can even say, well, Looking to, the, looking to the data, I can say that the problem is only when they are looking to a node of a certain content type or just on this landing page or just in some situation. So the, the, the worst risk is always try to look to the site completely blind and try to guess what's going on. And what's going on can be completely different from, um, from, from development and from production. So. Uh, 
Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's very rare to find a client these days, a very high-end client that is not using Memcache. So Memcache is definitely recommended um, and is definitely something that helps you scale uh, your site. Also, it's something very easy to install. Um, What kind of problems? 